Hi there, everyone. Welcome to the latest CTO Craft Bytes. Today, we're going to be looking at CTO strategy. This is the second in our four part series. But don't worry if you haven't watched the first part on the CTO Craft YouTube yet, you'll still be able to learn. If this is your first time at CTO Craft Bytes, let me tell you a bit more about this group. CTO Craft is a mentoring and coaching community for technology leaders around the world, focusing on supporting technologists in their leadership growth. Community members uh, are over 7,000 and the CTO and CTO Craft provides them with one-to-one -one coaching, mentoring groups and a curated Slack community and events like this one. If you're not a member of CTO Craft community, and are interested in becoming one, we'd like to get updates on these events on emails. I'll I'll post some links in the chat to help you do that. So let me do that now before we get started. There you go. There's some links in the chat. So I'm really pleased today. Uh, that Cornell is joining us to talk about strategy. I'm really looking forward to his talk. So I'm going to hand over to him and you can give us more of an introduction, Cornell. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Yes, my name is Cornel Fotulescu. I will share my screen in the same time so that um, we're winning some time here. Hope. Just need a confirmation to tell me that you see my screen. Huh? It's up. It's up, yes. And um, I work at Pentalog. I'm chief platform officer at Pentalog, uh, meaning I'm in charge with products and technology in the group. And we developed this um, series called CTO Fundamentals. And uh, as being said, this is the second session of it. I'm going to recall the summary of the first one, which is called Ideal CTO. Uh, where we have a character called Bob and he's a developer and he becomes a CTO, he has this great opportunity and he is changing the job for uh, the company uh, twice and he eventually gets an idealistic structure of the CTO role that I'm going to present uh, immediately. Uh, before going to do that, um, just a few uh, more information about how the session will be uh, ran. Uh, so there will be a Q&A part at the end. Usually the session, it takes between 33, 37 minutes, I put 35. Um, write your questions. Uh, there will be a moment at the end. Um, I expected this session to have more questions because we are looking at the CTO role from a very distinct um, uh, perspective, which is the strategy and how the CTO role is involved in strategy. Um, and in terms of the information you have in the slides, um, the insights, it's on the blue area, the highlights. Uh, and there is lots of text in, the, in some slides. Uh, and that's for you to, it should be easier when you get the slides and uh, look at the references um, after the session. So that's the intent, uh, intent of it. And uh, again, this is the second session and there will be another one, CTO tactics, and we will wrap everything else at the end with a better CTO. Now, where were we when we finished the ideal CTO? Bob discovered what CTO role means. He discovered many things, so I'm not going to do the session again, but uh, a very important um, um, learning that he had is that there are five things, five things, five priorities uh, he always has. And it doesn't really matter if it's one flavor of a CTO or another. We've talked a bit of the CTO flavors and uh, we've talked about big thinker, visionary, more of an infrastructure manager or operation managers and so forth, or external facing technologists. So it seems whatever the CTO flavor, these are the five priorities. And I strongly suggest for those who didn't manage to watch the previous episode to do it. Um, and things like innovate via technologies, 
the technology uh, innovation, uh, better exploit technology opportunities and all that. Uh, it's important, especially for some CTO flavors, but not for all of them. So what we have in these main responsibilities with high priority here is um, being a translator from business to technology, from technology to business. Um, and this is explained in the ideal session, but the, we need to remember that, the, uh, and this is why it's even more important to, to go to the end of this session, until the end of this session, is that the initial CTO role was a strategy role. So it wasn't a developer. So it was in from um, because the research facilities didn't have return on investment. So we invented, the industry invented the CTO role to make a better link between the business and the R&D facilities so that opportunities are translated into research and research in opportunities. Um, and then the partnership with executive uh, management, especially with the executive officer, seems crucial. Huh? So the more time we spend here, the more energy, the more we co-work together, the better. And we will see CTO strategy is all about that. Uh, we also have a new definition of governance we'll, that was important in the ideal CTO. We will get back to it in CTO tactics and, and a bit later, uh, but it's going to be a bit less um, interesting in this episode in the CTO strategy, but very, very important. Governance as efficiency management. And then there is facilitating work because the CTO is at the middle of many things and lots of work is being collected from all these areas, all the departments, and someone has to do it and to facilitate that work. Um, and then enhancing agility. Um, and that wasn't said so far, but uh, it's very, very important. Um, you will see it also later. Uh, usually what we've discovered is that uh, a CTO uh, not uh, fully engaged um, in agility, uh, who really studied, just knows about it, will treat equally all the aspects of agility. And uh, it's a matter of time until it becomes a detractor or a, a, a something will not work there. So that's very important, enhancing agility for the CTO. And one of the latest slides that we had in the previous talk was uh, Bob asking for not more resources, not more people in his team, but to share the technology uh, responsibility in the company. And he needed help. He wasn't an expert in, uh, in security, uh, not at all, in DevOps. And uh, it becomes wider and wider in, uh, in terms of what technology means. What are the concerns? And he was like surprised that uh, his executive officer said, yeah, why not? Let's do that. Um, so um, he's going to get a security officer to co-partner. He's going to get a VP of engineering to uh, help him with the job, which is interesting. Now he was surprised and another surprise comes the next second where the executive officer says, I also have something interesting for you. We're going to sell 30% of the company, so due diligence will start. And Bob, instead of being happy, because that's, I don't know, a new step in business development, so a new era, um, new plans, new horizons, and things like this, he's upset. And the reason he's upset, um, shocked even, is because he knows that many things are not in order. He was willing to have more people to co-partner, to share this responsibility, to delegate some parts of it, because um, he wanted to regain control, not in a uh, um, definition like micromanagement kind of control, but more like uh, in knowing how to uh, um, observe the system from all the right angles so that he can orient. Uh, the technology as it should be oriented. So uh, he, is, he feels depressed and things don't start to be um, very positive for him. Uh, things are uh, becoming challenging. Uh, series of episodes like meeting the investors, talking with them, 
where the investors say, uh, yeah, we want to do this and this, and uh, the technology should be um, um, an important aspect of valuation. And uh, Bob is mostly uh, off all that. He, he, he doesn't manage, emotionally speaking, to engage with them, uh, which is becoming also a question for the, for the executive officer and for the uh, investors investors so the negative consequence of this inadequate pos positioning is that uh, bob is going to um, uh, be challenged and he gets someone who is not really clear if he's going to be the cto in his place for two years or he's going to assist him but this is the context so someone is going to come with more maturity to help Bob uh, do the job well, because people feel like Bob is not up to the task. And also the executive officer has its own challenge because when discussing with the investors, he was saying, I just want to be the best in the industry. And the, the, the investors were saying, and that's not a good enough strategy. So we'll have to learn together. Uh, so first uh, invest in yourself, let the CTO, someone else will take care of of the CTO. Um, so that's the context. And uh, Bob is going back to his coach and he says, what's wrong with being the best in the industry? That's the, the strategy I love the most because um, uh, I can bring my own strategy into it because when you say it, it's generic enough, general enough, so I can say my technology strategy is uh, this part. And this is modern thinking for uh, Bob. And it makes sense because from the perspective of what he studied before that, uh, you know already that uh, fifth discipline is one of the Bibles for uh, the, the uh, holy books for uh, Bob. Uh, and he really likes the approach of strategy and strategic thinking through the uh, learning organizations. And, and, uh, and there is a framework there that, that, that Bob tried to apply and he felt uh, uh, instinctively uh, uh, natural for him. This is what should be done for all organizations. So, so there are uh, in this uh, strategic architecture, he, he has some principles of governance that the first square here and and the way to do that. So uh, when you look at this, it's like, uh, how do you know you're doing it? Uh, you recognize an organization who's having this mindset and this culture. And the second one is how do you do it? And it becomes better huh? with uh, with time. And this organizational learning um, belief and set of beliefs was what was driven uh, Bob until now. And he thought he's the strategy uh, of technology. He's accountable for that. So he's continuing to study because it helped him in during the ideal CTO. Now he's going to look at what strategy means. And he finds uh, videos about strategy generic enough to say, hey, strategy is not a goal. So wow, strategy is not a goal. OK, it's at highest level, not not all levels. Um, and strategy is a buzzword. Everyone is talking about strategy in many ways. And it comes from Greek and um, no one agrees to what strategy means and this becomes the challenge in itself so what strategy means so he feels he needs a definition of strategy as he needed a definition for for the CTO role he's having a de definition for strategy now so he's looking at he likes his history I, I'm sure you've uh, seen that so far so he's looking at von Molke who innovated a lot in in terms of uh, war agility I would say through technology so he was moving um, uh, armies fast and he was saying like politics should not mind about strategy strategy is the general work so I'm the strategy in a sense von Molke or Bob in um, and the, the executive officer is is politics um, so he was looking like this and and he said look von Molke said the uh, politics should not mind with the uh, with the strategy uh, and there is also uh, there are very interesting examples in 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 this book where uh, von Molke says hey look when Bismarck uh, uh, me uh, messed with that uh, we've all, almost uh, lost uh, uh, our competitive advantage when we were fighting with France uh, it generated something that we called uh, la commune um, uh, but that's a different story um, Bob might tell you 
in an advanced series about that. So he's going to take these uh, learnings and he's sharing them with the executive officers and said, hey, this is strategy. Uh, I'm a general for you. And the executive officer says, no, sorry. Uh, I'm, the, I'm the chief strategy around here, uh, which is completely different from everything else that Bob knew. Why? Because in the same time, the executive officer is being mentored and trained by the investors and they have a different understanding of, of, of strategy. And they say, hey, this is strategy. It's holistic. It's not about the parts. It's about choice. It's also about things that you don't do. It's very specific and concrete. It's about positioning. Uh, in a sense, it's what makes you unique, superior. Uh, and all this is new for Bob. Uh, so he's okay. I'm going to get references from my executive officer and read this kind of strategy books. So he's going to Michael Porter's competitive strategy and he's uh, reading about it. And he understands that, in fact, uh, strategy uh, makes some uh, customers unhappy, uh, which is absolutely odd. It was impossible. How can you refuse a customer? You should make all customers happy. Uh, it um, you know, should make clear what we don't do. And in fact, the better the strategy, the better you know what you don't do. It's also about the environment. It's about something that um, um, accumulates and it's about winning over time. But the most important, the most important aspect that he learns from this is that strategy is creating superior, uh, superior economic uh, performance that fuels valuation. Uh, so this is what he learns. And this is what will become, in a, in a sense, the strategy in the company. Uh, and we also know now what strategy isn't, also from the same body of knowledge. It's not operational efficiency. It's not best practice. It's not about goals. And Bob is going to learn and discover much more about it. It doesn't make it more uh, uh, less uh, uh, important. It doesn't make uh, it's, uh, all these aspects uh, uh, less, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, intense they all require thinking uh, and strategic thinking in a sense but it's about tactics and that's another episode so he continues his learning and he lands in uh, uh, in an advisor uh, online and uh, he watches a, the video and uh, he looks at it and he understands that it's not just the the definition of strategy it's also about strategic thinking and uh, he quickly understands that the part of the, the session in this in this video is not uh, aligned with anything else. So it shouldn't be a functional strategy in the company. Uh, we only need to have the business strategy uh, alone. And uh, for big groups, you might have corporate uh, or group strategy, which might be different. But there shouldn't be a marketing strategy. There shouldn't be a technology strategy. Huh? Uh, so he learns all that. He goes back to the executive officer and said, OK, let's uh, let's look at our strategy and how it works uh, uh, for us. So what makes them unique? They look at the industry, where they, it's heading, what's the average profitability, what are the customer segments? They look at the value chain and say, we invest here. This is where we are. Uh, and what are the substitutes to what we do? Uh, what are the customer needs, pricing, and so forth. So this is, in fact, the first step of the strategy. So he's wrapping everything up. He knows he wasn't in the most important circles when they discussed about the strategy, but he already feels he's getting interesting insights and something will change in his way of engaging with strategy. So just a short uh, uh, reminder, please note your questions. Uh, there will be a Q&A. Uh, in the end. So Bob is continuing his study and he goes to Technology Strategy Patterns, which is a book for technology and strategy in the same time. Huh? And here there is a, there's a screen capture, uh, a photo with one of the page where there are many tools in strategy. And Bob says, I don't know what uh, five fourths are. I, I've heard from uh, Porters, but I need to study it. I don't know what uh, answer of growth matrix is, things like this. So he's going to look at them and study one by one. Uh, he knew basic standard stuff from the agile world, like SWOT analysis and things like this. So he's making a course, a full course on five forces. Because uh, if you look at the strategy, when the theorist of strategy, business strategy, uh, st 
start to structure the, the business world, the first thing they looked at was competition. So the, you can't say you have a strategy if you don't include at all, according to them, uh, the notion of competition, what happens elsewhere. Uh, so this was a very important aspect of it. And the, the critics, critics that comes along with, with all these tooling and aspects about competition is that first, it's very expensive to do a, an elaborated strategy. Now he knows there are different speeds and the strategy isn't uh, going, it's not a big bank approach. So you learn, learn along the way, it emerges, um, so you enrich it. But uh, doing a strategic work for an, with an advisor, uh, that's easily half a million uh, dollars. So that's a big critic. So he needs to choose what in strategy he's looking at because he cannot do everything. And there's are, there are also other kind of critics. Uh, for example, in the Lords of Strategy, where you, you have like a series of uh, wonderful uh, references with all many important uh, contributors to the strategy world. This is why it's called Lords of Strategy. But some of the topics pop up in uh, things like um, uh, there's, there's, we miss a playbook about strategy. Uh, the, there are some conflicts in, in, in uh, what everyone is saying. Uh, and also strategy is not about talent and all this kind of stuff. So wrapping this up, so he understood different perspectives of strategy. Uh, he understood there are also uh, schools of strategy, he's learning about it, uh, and um, uh, and he's willing to go much further. He gets back to the executive officer to apply all this with him and say, so let's do a workshop and look at our value chain. So they look at what they do, the product, they look at the value chain, and they say, what are we doing? Do we do it differently for our users in that value chain? And if we do it differently, uh, are we doing it with technology in sense of we replace some steps in the value chain because, I don't know, we've created a sophisticated product, a different design, or is this some resilience in it? And if so, the what we do is strategy uh, with the technology we're building. If not, the areas where we can improve is more like doing fast uh, or better in terms of quality, but that's it. Um, and uh, I don't know, like uh, cheaper hmm? uh, when we say better. And that's a very uh, operational efficiency that goes into tactics. Now, why is this important? Because uh, Bob already feels like if it's operational efficiency, he needs to focus differently than if it's strategic uh, uh, what they are doing. So that's a, a very interesting uh, insight. Now they are taking all this and drawing back their lean canvas uh, and um, they uh, they think of what they don't do for the customers, what are the trade-offs. And at this point in time, uh, most important aspect is where the technology that Bob is building is innovating in the value chain uh, so that they do it differently. Also, uh, they didn't manage to recruit another CTO help advisor or someone to get uh, in place uh, in the place of Bob and the investors are kind of happy with what uh, how Bob evolved and they don't want to change Bob anymore. Now, in the workshop with the investors, they say, look, OK, it seems like what we do with technology, it's uh, uh, we innovate in the value chain. So there is something about it. So this is how we value the company. We look at revenue scale, we look at the bid down, we look at gross churn and all that. And we also look at scalability. So scalability became a valuator for, uh, for the company. And um, Bob is taking this with the executive officer and says, let's, let's go further with this. Because in architecture, there is a, there is a, uh, a metaphor called business scaling machine. And business scaling machine is how can you scale in a sense operations or whatever you do uh, without increasing the cost uh, uh, proportionally. Uh, so uh, with the same technology team, for example, now you have 100 people, 10 in technology. Uh, next year you have 1,000 people and still 10 in technology and it works, just to give an, an example. 
And um, he's looking also from evolutionary architecture at all the ETs, uh, portability, scalability, extensibility. And he's, he's building what we call the fitness uh, functions, and he's trying to, to define them, what are the, the fitness functions for, his, um, uh, for the system so that the, the business um, uh, as a system is, is scalable. There are also some uh, items from their checklist, uh, which is which emerged like uh, no single points of knowledge, no single points of failure, uh, engage people and so forth. But the thing that still troubles Bob, and he didn't feel he got it yet, because from all the strategy perspective, we don't really talk about people. We don't talk about skills. And the, the key challenge here is how relevant is whatever he learned so far when he knows it's very difficult to get great people, for example, security engineers, huh? it doesn't find them on the market. So is uh, talent and team part uh, a, a strategic thing or not? Uh, so this is the area where he's heading with his uh, study. Now he remembers from the uh, uh, Maurice Count of Nassau, who was one who was fight, fighting with the Spanish uh, for the independence of Netherlands. And this person innovated, and he, he's, this battle, for example, is considered the, the modern uh, battle, first modern battle. So he was the, the challenge of Maurice was um, in terms of moving the infantry, for example, when they were retreating or doing left or right maneuvers, uh, it was challenging. That, that was not something you could do in a war, in a battle. So what he did, he practiced this before the war. It's like uh, uh, preparing uh, uh, disaster recovery, uh, in a sense. So he's uh, trying all the options, and he understands, in fact, that uh, how important it is to prepare and repeat. And we'll get back to this in future episodes about prepare and repeat. Uh. But he understands that standardization is key, reward talent is key, team is key. Without what Morris did, and he considered it strategic, Morris, huh? without this, uh, he couldn't win the war. This is what at least uh, strategists and historians feel today. Morris couldn't war the, uh, win the war with the Spanish without doing all that. And all that was about the people huh? and the way they are organized. And then other insight comes from the sovereign individual, where we feel like uh, the world, the entire world was disrupted by one person. Uh, remember 9-11, uh, the, the uh, terrorist attack, it changed the world. But right? we are all getting to security checks in a different way. And we had war in Afghan and all that. And, and feels, Bob feels like in what they do, even a very determined kid can be their competition, huh? which is an interesting insight. So, um, so he's wrapping all these together and he says, okay, there are three kinds of strategies in the world. Uh, one is the traditional strategy from the schools of strategy. The second one is no strategy, which is the worst, <laughs> uh, not having a strategy. Looks like we've just got a little issue with Cornell's connection. Uh, we'll see if we can get you back quite soon. Just see if we wait for Cornell to rejoin. We'll be with you in a second.
All right, Cornell, I've invited you back in. Hopefully this, this time it will work. Yeah, we've invited Cornell uh, in a second time. We're just waiting for the software to, to let him in. Welcome back. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Well, I don't know what happened. I disconnected from, I was seeing you. I was hearing you. I uh, just, uh, I wasn't sharing anymore. <laughs> right. Well, you're back now, Cornell. I hand back over to you. Um, so was this the last slide where you we've missed me or? Uh, I, I was talking here and then I... When I switched to this slide, it disconnected, I think. You just talked about no strategy and continue from there. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so um, uh, because the, the, the new idea in, in Bob's mind is that uh, you have a direction and you can go through that in that direction um, implicitly without doing anything that's no strategy and if you look at how can i position differently how can i go faster there how can i this works tends to, this work tends to go into the strategy so no strategy seems business as usual can work but it's usually less efficient and uh, the working strategy is you take from the theory theory field uh, all these uh, uh, schools of strategy and the business school of strategy in particular you choose what you do and you apply in the priorities that make sense for you in your uh, context. And the final body of knowledge that Bob says, well, this is what I needed, in fact, comes from Lawrence Friedman, an historian and, uh, of strategy. And uh, he explains, he talks about the army, of course, but also business. And the key insight here, and I will go a bit... Um, uh, faster because I've lost a few seconds for us and sorry for that. Strategy is all about having better positioning towards a given direction. Um, so this is um, one of the last lessons for Bob. And he goes back to the CTO role. He's looking at the requirements of the CTO role that he already had from the ideal CTO. And he says that highest priority was the business translating to technology and technology to business, business opportunities. And that seemed to be the responsibility that was pra practiced the most when working on strategy. And there are some key insights here. So business scaling machine, for example, may be competitive advantage, but it's not for all CTOs, it's not for all companies. It's very important. And if you are in, uh, if you are uh, uh, more in operational efficiency, you, different, you need a different focus, different set of skills, maybe different approach anyway. And there should be, uh, there shouldn't be technology strategy and functional strategy, there should be just the strategy. Who's accountable for the strategy? the executive officer, the whole, the entire executive management team is working together in, in enabling the strategy, refining it, proposing to the executive officer. Eventually the executive officer is the one who says, this is it. Uh, and uh, who uh, the event, the, um, the team, the executive, executive team will deploy it further with everyone else. Huh? The, so it starts from the highest levels. Uh, we didn't work on governance, facilitate work, and enhance agility. Now, let's see other kind of learnings. So in terms of uh, uh, translator role, uh, sometimes talent might be competitive advantage, saying, look, uh, in uh, business continuity, there was crisis, uh, co uh, the COVID crisis, 
uh, we are in Europe uh, and we have uh, teams in Vietnam and Vietnam is fine. And it, it, eventually Vietnam was fine through the whole crisis in Europe, which was uh, very interesting for those who had a team there. Or uh, I'm not going to have um, uh, a team in, in, uh, in Europe because it's too close to war. Uh, if I'm having my teams somewhere in, in uh, Moldova, for example, so I'm going to put something in Guadalajara or in France or in UK, I will insist more or things like this. Huh? So it's, it can be part of the strategic positioning that makes a difference and accelerates us uh, in our direction. Uh, if technology fosters innovation, innovation it fosters technology uh, strategy and depending on the skills of initiatives, some initiatives may require more strategic thinking than the others. Not every feature is strategic. Huh? Uh, an important aspect of it was also to uh, acknowledge that uh, the CTO contributes to the strategy, but doesn't own the strategy. So I know this might be disappointing many of us uh, here, but CTO is not the owner of the strategy. Uh, CTO uh, contributes to it. Uh, executive officer is accountable. Uh, and plays the more impo important role here. Then strategy is too often a popularity contest. We didn't talk about it, but it comes from Michael Porter's work and I think it was mentioning. So uh, this also uh, makes companies lose lots of energy. Um, so there needs to be some sort of uh, collaboration and openness uh, and uh, not fight for, uh, I'm contributing the most to the strategy. Uh, shouldn't make everyone happy, key insight. So we can refuse. Again, I gave this example at the end of the session idea of CTO, uh, IKEA. You go to IKEA and say, I want, I'm this. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself there. I'm really sorry. Uh, we seem to be having some technical difficulties today. We'll get them back with you as soon as possible. Yeah, Welcome yeah. I, I think there is something. I don't understand what. I have connection. I have everything. Um, uh, something. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry for everyone here uh, who... <laughs> um, who misses these minutes, uh, but we are close to the end, so <laughs> bear with me. Um, yeah, so not a popularity context and uh, uh, balance between competitors and co-creation is also a part of the strategic work. Um, and in terms of skills, and we are heading to the last slide from the presentation. Um, uh, remember this slide with the Dreyfus acquisition model. So what Bob practiced the most was partnership with the executive officer. That was the, and it's a skill, in, a particular skill. And also something that brings him to the competitive level because when you work on strategy, you work holistically. So look at all the perspectives and you become without, uh, you like it or not, you're more strategic. Huh? So. Uh, in the next sessions, you will go into more 360 degrees and things like this. But these are the skills he, uh, um, uh, he trained uh, the most. Here it is. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, sorry for the interruptions. Uh, I hope there are some questions there. And um, uh, yeah, this was the second episode. Next episode is about CTO tactics. And I'm available for you for questions. Thank you so much, Cornel. That, that was fascinating. It's making me think already. Um, so if you want to add, ask questions, uh, there's an ask a question button at the bottom of your screens. Tap on that, follow the instructions, and when we get a few questions through, we'll start answering them. So um, Tim Kohlberg has asked the first question. Uh, he said, you mentioned a lot of books during your session. Do you actually recommend reading them? Or maybe you can recommend one of them as a starting point for CTO strategy. Um, it's very difficult to answer to this question. 
because as everything that makes sense, um, um, I didn't invent this. I'm a strong believer, as Bismarck said, we don't have time to learn everything. We learn from others. So I try to win from what others said, then practice, test. So I think I would recommend all the books, except maybe the, I don't know, uh, for Maurice, which is a historical uh, 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 event that, that's a bit less relevant. But Porters, uh, Lords of Strategies, they're all very, very useful for CTOs. I, I've learned so much. Uh, uh, so, uh, and all of them uh, have value. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, so please read them. Maybe a list of priorities I could give at the end uh, about it. Uh, are you still hearing me? Yep, we can hear you. <laughs> I, I, <guess> now I, <laughs> I, uh, I don't know if uh, everyone is uh, hearing me and when. So yeah, please read the books uh, with, with your own speed. Own speed. Yeah? Uh, I always recommend Fifth Discipline. Uh, it's a great fundamental book. So fi fi philosophical. Uh, Lords of Strategy, very interesting. Competitive Adventures, the same. That would be the maybe the order I'd, I'd go through them. Thank you. I hope that answers your question there, Tim. Um, while we're waiting uh, and see if you've got any other questions, I might dive in with a question if that's okay, Cornell. Yeah, please. So I, I was wondering, um, uh, when how, how can a CTO become more strategic when she's facilitating work at the same time? I mean, most of us are very busy. How do, how do we find that balance, do you think? Well, I think the first part of the questions comes from, um, am I more in strategy or more in operational efficiency? That, that can uh, make a, a big difference in the answer. Um, then, uh, I think you need to do both, but it's a matter of priorities. So, uh, if there is no clear vision, no clear direction. You can look at your list of responsibilities, but you don't know. So everything can change so quickly. That's not a good thing. So I think I would focus on my partnership with the executive officer to clarify these aspects, at least temporary, uh, and say that's the clear direction we're heading. That, that's the so for me uh, so having a clear direction is more important than doing work and you'll see in the fourth episode why this is very important also because there is something about what we leave behind also uh, because our role is temporary so what's going to be there what am i going to transfer to the next CTO, to the next generation how is my company going to continue to to uh, achieve the, their goals and go through the direction if I don't have a direction. <laughs> and if I, uh, so uh, first strategy. And it might feel less interesting because it's not technology, it's not, not necessary. Yeah? Uh, uh, it's no development and things like this. Help your executive officer solve these questions. Uh, everything else is less important because you don't know which direction you're going in if you don't have this strategy. Yes, yes. Um, makes sense. I, I um, see someone put a question. May I? Yeah, of course. There's a question in the comments, isn't there? Yeah. yeah how to assess the CTO cap uh, capabilities? Well, um, uh, there are different ways of doing that. Uh, you can do that yourself. You can look yourself and say, uh, from time to time, and you'll see in the fourth session, there is a radar with skills and you can self-assess. How good am I in, in these skills? Do that. Uh, now, this is not a commercial event, so I'm, but uh, we are doing it at Pentalo. Um, so sorry for uh, uh, someone. God sent a question like this. And, uh, 
<laughs> we we have also situations. I also know, I also know uh, people at uh, Sitio Craft in the uh, are uh, preparing something in this area. Uh, so um, uh, just ask them. Huh? So uh, um, for uh, uh, when we do this, for I need to do this kind of assessments by, myself when we do the work at Pentalo because we offer teams. And what happens for us is we have a CTO, he's working, we offer them a team, uh, and we work for two, three years, and the CTO changes. And then the new CTO comes, and there are two options. And one says, uh, wow, wonderful, what a great job. I have a foundation, I can go in the given direction. Or the other option is, oh. <laughs> so I, I need tools to work with the CTOs I'm working so that they can mirror their skills and we work together. This is why we are doing it. Uh, but it's something we need to do it more than something that it's valuable in terms of revenue. Talk also with CTO Craft, uh, people uh, organizing this, they are working hard to help you become better. Um, this is my recommendation, in fact. Uh, ask uh, uh, people you're in touch, Andy, and say, uh, uh, can you assess me? Can you, uh, do you have something there? I know they're preparing something because we've talked a bit uh and uh yeah i hope my my answer helps you can do that yourself look at the slides with the radar and say where i'm standing in these skills uh, if you're looking at commercial product uh, we can do that if you're looking for uh, uh, help mentoring uh, your journey as a cto uh, ju just contact uh, people at cto craft and also, Thanks I've joined CTO Craft, and uh, I didn't find ways to contribute in a different way today. So, uh, but I'm sure I will be a bit more present in the community uh, a bit later. Uh, and I'm very happy to to answer to these kind of questions. Great. So you'll be able to track Cornell down on a, on the CTO Craft Slack community if you want. Exactly. To I'm there already. I'm there. <laughs> Right, another question we've got come in is um, uh, strategy is also to get the resources of the company to, walk to work towards a common goal. Do you agree? Can, can, can you repeat that? Can... So the, the question is strategy is also to get all the resources of the company to work towards a common goal. Do you agree with that statement? Yes, yes, very important, very, very important. In fact, the most of the strategic work, and it's easy to have a metaphor from war and from battles and from um, where you put your resources, it makes a difference. So when you say, I need to increase my team, if you say that because you have some challenges in operations, some customers unhappy and things like this, you can do that by asking people, budget, and things like this. But normally, this should be linked with a strategy and say, is this an area where we want to afford, when we afford doing more? Because usually in strategy, you have different uh, aspects. There are also things that you want to sacrifice if things don't go well. Imagine you have five teams. They're all working on different areas. Three of them are the strategy and two are things that uh, catch the attention of competitors or you try a new product and things like this. If you would sacrifice something, it's there, right? Because this is strategic. So uh, all this should be linked. Uh, in my opinion, the budget should be completely, fully linked with the strategy and say, these are our resources and this is what remains for nice to have options and things like this. And it needs to be clear so that we don't get frustrated and say they don't understand that. Uh, we are part of the same game. Uh, we co-partner with the executives. Thank you, Cornell. We've got another question here. Um, can you elaborate on the difference of CTO strategic role dependent of whether the company is an IT company where the product is the main service of the company, or B, a company where IT plays a supporting role? Yes. Um, there's also something very important about the CTO and information officer here, because we've kind of lost where they, do we need both? Do we, 
uh, and the, the CTO was always outward focused, uh, while the information officer was inwards. Uh, so looking at tools, uh, do we use, uh, I don't know, uh, Teams, Slack, things like this. Well, that was under the, the uh, infrastructure and the, the inf information officer. Now, there are CTOs uh, that are in the position, they, they have a successful product, but there are things uh, behind. There are CTOs with uh, information officer uh, equal. And there is also CTO under the leadership uh, reporting to the information officer. Now, key here, very important. You need to have one architecture, one architecture. So when you do two, you have two architectures. Remember Conway's law. It's going to have two architectures. Many companies lose a lot from here. So uh, whatever the choice, ensure is one above the other and things are clear. That's the first thing. Huh? And uh, if it's the CTO, the leader of everything, and there is some sort of responsible with infrastructure and things like this, okay. If it's the information officer and then the CTO, okay. Now, why is this important? Because um, companies at strategic level lose lots of energy because we don't understand what happens in technology and we don't treat architecture at a strategic level, but strategy is tightly linked with architecture. Just to give you an example, I met a customer who developed a product uh, three months ago and they developed a module for customer. And the same time, behind the scenes, someone is buying Salesforce product. In the, and the question was, why didn't you use it as a microservice for Kent answer? Why? Because two architectures. Where they spend their money, one month and a half to, to fully do the minimum features in, in the product for the customer. You see where I'm getting? How many times we get this? One architecture, focus on the product, uh, okay, uh, and that strategy, but the architecture is in the strategy because the budget goes from their consequences in technical debt. So they merge in a sense. Architecture should be, in a sense, strategy. Um, uh, so I think this is very important. And I, if I didn't completely answer to the question, um, because it, I can talk a, a lot about it, uh, I think that part of the answer is one architecture. Now, if you are focused on product or you are leveraging, you are automating, you, you provide services. And what you do is, in fact, uh, you automate around. The key here is skills are not the same. Skills are not the same. One uh, uh, is uh, more strategic. The other one is more collaborative, listening to users, uh, documenting processes. But what is all this work? It's still architecture work. Uh, you have an enterprise architecture, you have business processes, you have these steps and you say, we will automate this one. We we'll replace this tool with another tool. Uh, skills are not the same. Uh, uh, and uh, there is actually a great book, very old, called, I think this one. Uh, I don't know if, it, uh, if you see it. Um, it's about e-business, e-business. And, and the... the the problem is that CTOs don't know e business by default. So I think if you are automating, read that book. <laughs> it's from 2012, so be uh, mindful about it. But it's uh, automation is very different than going to customers. Uh, and because, for example, in terms of skills, you need today RPA, low coding, BPM, in an end product, if you, it's not with what you start. Hmm? It's not. Uh, uh, I hope. I hope it helps. Thank you. I'm going to ask one last question and give you maybe thirty seconds to answer this one as a, a quick last one, and then we'll wrap up. So, um, hands-on versus management CTO. Which do you prefer? Hands-on, uh, like uh, expert in development and in coding? I think so, yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. So um, definitely not hands on. The problem is when we when things are challenging, stressful, we turn out to do what we are good at. So what are we good at? Code. So we will try to solve the problems ourselves. That's not going to scale. That's not going to. And it's actually a very important. It's not a flavor, a visionary CTO. It's a subset. We call that the CTO startup. And the challenge with them is they get stuck. They get stuck and uh, because their power comes from being an expert in development. And how to get unstuck? Because their adoption speed, like adapt in the company and uh, uh, switch mindset, paradigm, things like this, act differently. Their adoption speed is far slower than the adoption speed of the company. So the company adapts at the speed and the employee here, the CTO, adapts uh, slower. It's just a matter of time until this person will become a huge problem for everyone. So if you want to become a huge problem for everyone, uh, be hands-on, uh, do, do yourself and all that. Now, if we talk about previous experience, what were you before becoming the CTO? Were you a manager coming from processes? Were you a QA? Were you a developer? I think that's a slightly different question. It might be hidden behind the, the previous one. And uh, I think... Um, if you don't understand, you don't have any appetite for technology, you are going to lack empathy and you are going to find yourself in two extremes. Either the team will do whatever they want, either you are going to constrain the team, very difficult to be in the middle, and that's the risk. I'm not saying it's not working. I've seen some exceptional CTOs doing this properly, but it's hard. Huh? Uh, so I think that's the hardest part. Now, if you come from management operations uh, with technical background, you've been an agile code, like doing extreme programming. And someone who did extreme programming and becoming a CTO, for me, it's, it's a, a great uh, background. Mm -hmm. Because you understand quality, lead management, test-driven development, engineering practices, and, so I would I, I still think the best case is technology with agile engineering practices background. Thanks very much, Cornell. And thanks very much for that very uh, uh, comprehensive answer. So uh, I'm sure everyone who's come will uh, join me in giving a big hand to Cornell, though it's quiet from all of you. Um, uh, thanks very much for everyone who's come along and particular thanks to everyone who's asked questions. Uh, Cornell will be back with part three in the near future. So uh, I look forward to seeing all of you again soon. Thanks very much. See you later. Thank you. Bye-bye.